Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research for the release of our 253rd quarterly review. The August 2020 uh, review will be published tonight, but for today's purposes, we're report, re, re, um, not having imposing any reporting restrictions. And so what we're talking about today is not under embargo, and you may report on it um, immediately. We think the issues that the world and the UK are confronting um, mean that we ought to be reporting these um, almost immediately. Um, I'm very glad this morning to be joined not only by the staff at NISA who helped us put this uh, work together uh, remotely uh, and coordinated that work over the last month or so remarkably efficiently, if I may say, to them. But I'm glad this morning to be joined by Barry Nesbitt, who has coordinated the work with the team on our prospects for the global economy, and also by um, my deputy director, Gary Young, who, will, um, who has coordinated the work on the UK economy and will talk to the prospects for that economy. We plan to finish with a, uh, about 20 minutes or so to the hour, leaving plenty of time for questions, which will be fielded in the first instance by my colleague, Rachel Tukey. And we'll try to answer the questions by around midday. But if there are some questions we haven't had time to, turn to, uh, to turn to, we'll be happy to deal with them um, afterwards uh, bilaterally with people. Thank you very much. Um, before I um, um, launch into the main detail of the forecast, as you know, it is custom for me to release a director's remarks. You have them in your pack and they outline some of the broader issues I think that we're facing and also point to the work more generally we've been doing uh, at the Institute. And, and so I think there are two things we want to start with when we think of the COVID quandary, as I'm calling it. And the question in the first instance is, what is it our objective of public policy at the moment? Underpinning a lot of it is to create confidence in the capability of the health sectors around the world that will ultimately help smooth the spread of the virus and limit the extent to which there's a further peak. And that has two economic implications. Firstly, the lockdowns themselves have been an economic instrument designed to smooth the spread of the virus around the world. And as a consequence, there's been a, a huge impact on economies with the kind of um, retrograde movements in growth that none of us have experienced in our lifetimes. But subsequently as well, as we learn to live with the virus, there will be ongoing changes in the way that we do things that will be in place for quite some time. This will mean some reorientation of our resources, some retraining, uh, and, and all of this we think will take some time and will impact on the economy in a, in a semi-permanent way. The word that's often used is scarring. And I know both um, of Gar Barry and Gary will refer to these issues um, when they come to their sections. Clearly, um, what we're seeing is both a negative demand and supply shock. Uh, these are uh, amplified by the fact they're happening across the world, in a global world. Um, the UK economy is, is vulnerable and exposed to changes in demand from the rest of the world. And, and as ever, these shocks are exposing existing weak economic structures. There's early evidence to suggest that economies that had vulnerabilities in healthcare or uh, other forms of vulnerabilities and lack of economic infrastructures or limited fiscal capacities have suffered more than other economies. So as well as a shock, uh, this crisis is, ex is, is revealing and exposing weak economic structures. We expect as, as, as over the next year or so that both public and private debt will increase. The long-lived long secular downturn in policy rates will be sustained. Um, and even though there has been remarkably fast policy reaction, the uncertainty about future waves, long-term health consequences, and I think in many places, a lack of confidence in public health overall, uh, will act to um, um, limit the recovery on demand side, both from households consumption and from firm level investment. Um, there seems to be evidence of more resilience uh, in places that there are higher levels of skills and where the digital economy has been well developed. Um, and maybe these can be formulated in a way to meet the regional imbalances in the UK and elsewhere that we're seeing in the world. But this is all going to require consistent long-term policies that are independent of um, changes in political hue that we see regularly in the UK. Consistency and long-term policies are what we're going to need. I think we're also concerned about firm level dynamism 
in the presence of the COVID and Brexit challenge. And it's also becoming clear that this particular crisis is interacting with poverty and inequality, and in many cases, making it worse than it would otherwise have been. And so the COVID quandary is for fiscal and monetary policy to do whatever it can, and yet still maintain the credibility of the monetary and financial settlement, if only because we don't know when this will come back and how badly it will come back, and we will need those tools to be deployed again. If I now may um, turn to Barry, who will go through some of these issues and others uh, in more detail on the basis of the prospects of the world economy that have been prepared, as you can see, with, with a team that has been hard at work over the last month or so. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Jagjit. And good morning, everyone. And um, I'm Barry Nesbitt, um, and I, my task today really is to run through our um, outlook for the global economy and our, our global economy forecast is not a, a work produced by a single person it's work produced by a team and um, just to acknowledge the work of the team in producing this in uh, as Jagjit said in remote circumstances um, and in with COVID at the front very difficult economic times. So let me just turn first to the short-term outlook headlines that we have. Um, I think it's important to start off by noting that since we put together our May forecast, which was back in the middle of April, the global number of COVID-19 cases has increased sixfold. Um, and with that in mind, the economic outlook remains uncertain, um, particularly as countries are at different stages of what I think is best called a still spreading pandemic. In terms of our short-term outlook, our, our main case forecast scenario is for a fall in global GDP of 5% this year, which is slightly um, worse than we had in May, where we had minus 3.5%. But um, given our assumptions about um, lockdowns um, gradually easing and our assumption that we don't have a second a wave of the virus um, in the winter time, in our winter time, I should say, then we expect uh, an increase or projected increase of six and a quarter percent next year as activity rebounds. That said, as you can see from our assumptions that I briefly mentioned, the risks to our main case are on the downside. Um, the lockdowns in advanced economies have been at their most stringent in the second quarter of this year where economies have faced a demand shock, hitting consumer spending and business investment, a supply shock, particularly with people not working for, in many cases, about three months or longer, and a confidence or and an uncertainty shock, which uh, we saw particularly in financial markets back in March, but which is still going on, certainly in terms of confidence about things like uh, shopping, for example. And, um, the shocks that we've seen have been countered by policy stimulus and where our estimate is that the fiscal stimulus that's been injected into the economies has reduced or acted to reduce the overall global GDP loss by about a third. In terms of other, the other key economic magnitude, inflation, I guess, um, we're expecting that to remain low in the short term with OECD inflation projected about 1.5% this year, slightly higher next. And in the medium term, we see risks on inflation of both inflation being quite a bit higher and also inflation staying quite a bit lower. Let me start by the sort of run through by looking at what I call the damage done. Um, first point to make is that the output growth that we had expected before COVID-19 hit for 2020 and 2021 has been lost. And we project that GDP, which will fall this year, but rise next, um, won't regain its pre-COVID-19 level in the US until early 2023, and in the Euro area until late 2023. That sounds an awful long way away, but um, that shows, in some senses, the scale of the falls that we've seen. 
In contrast, however, the latest, the, the, the recently published data for China shows that China has effectively already regained its end 2019 GDP level. And you can see that on the left hand chart, the gap opening up between what would have, what was projected for GDP growth in the global economy uh, back at the end of last year and what we're now projecting. And the balance of risks is on our, we feel is on the downside because of the continued spread of the virus and the risk of a second wave of outbreak. As economists, I think it's natural to talk in terms of GDP, in terms of thinking about damage, but I, I just like to rewind a little bit and say, that's possibly, you know, just the feature that we look at GDP. We have to remember that when we were putting the presentation together and the forecast together, nearly 600,000 people had died from COVID-19 worldwide with almost 14 million confirmed cases. These figures are still rising and we don't yet have a vaccine. In terms of damage, that seems to me a very important way of thinking about it. But not only damage in that sense, but unemployment has risen. And the left-hand chart shows the rise in unemployment that we've seen particularly in the US. And there are concerns that when job support schemes end in various countries, there'll be a further increase in joblessness. In terms of where GDP has fallen, the right-hand side chart shows quarterly changes in GDP for a range of economies. And um, the, the key point we would draw from this is the different pattern across economies. So we're seeing obviously a, a sharp fall in China in the first quarter, but then a bit of a rebound in the second quarter from that. We're seeing probably the Euro area, the advanced economies, the US, the, the greatest damage effects being in the second quarter of this year. But if one looks at Brazil, where clearly the virus is spreading at the moment, um, the damage is both in the second and third quarters of the year. Looking more broadly, the advanced economies, industrial production has fallen sharply, as has world trade. And I, one of the things I wanted to point out was to look at the G7, where the chart on the slide shows the level of GDP um, for the US, which is the top line, the solid black line, and the G7 excluding the US. And in terms of our projection, we're expecting um, US GDP to fall back to around its 2017 level this year. But non-US G7 GDP is set to fall back to its 2013 level this year before rebounding next. And it's one interesting thing is the gap in performance that has built up since the financial crisis between those two groups of economies. Of course, it's not just about damage, it's about limiting damage. And the G7 fiscal response, fiscal policy response, I should say, has been larger than in the financial crisis as the left-hand chart shows. Um, the response hasn't been coordinated, but if one looks certainly at the data in quarterly terms, it's certainly synchronized. Um, our simulations show that fiscal policy response has mitigated about a third of the potential GDP loss, and spillovers have obviously helped, um, for, particularly for small open economies. And the right-hand side panel chart just shows that um, the level of GDP loss relative to what one would have thought GDP would have been in 2021. And one can see that the countries that have had the larger fiscal stimulus are, in, in our projections at least, seeing the projected smaller GDP losses relative to what might have been expected. Of course, it's not just about the advanced economies. And so I just want to spend a couple of slides looking at beyond the advanced economies. It's important to note that, let me call them COVID-19 hotspots, have moved as the year has passed. Started China, Europe, US, Brazil, India, and um, clearly there are other countries in which um, COVID-19 is increasing at the moment. And emerging market countries are particularly exposed 
large, in large part because of the less de developed healthcare systems, but also because they're exposed to changes in exchange rates. We've seen sharp exchange rate depreciations in some uh, emerging economies, to reductions in trade, um, some of the behavioural responses from government and individuals, uh, particularly on things like international travel and tourism. And the left-hand chart shows um, the path of uh, global trade as a share of GDP for various entities. You can see that a sort of plateauing of that share for the world economy um, and in recent years or over the past decade more like and the um, the share of those in China has also pulled back. The right hand panel looks at uh, a chart from um, one of the boxes in the review, box C, which looks at um, emerging markets um, and COVID-19 and there you can see that the emerging markets are slightly more exposed to tourism and travel revenues as a direct contribution to GDP than advanced economies as a, as a whole. But of course, there are variances between countries. So a country like Mexico, for example, is very heavily exposed to this, whereas Russia less so. Deglobalization is a theme that has been heightened by COVID-19 and some of the um, trends that we have seen over in the previous chart about uh, world trade growth, but trade and foreign direct investment trends have also slowed. And over the past year, we've seen tariffs and reducing global value chains becoming hot topics for policymakers and companies. And we have a, another box in the review, box A, which looks at deglobalization as a, an important theme for the world economy. And as I alluded to the previous chart, emerging economies, as with any group uh, of entities, will have their differences. And yet another box in the review, box B, looks at the BRICS economies and points out that since, or rather over the past decade, the progress of the BRICS um, as individual countries has been very, very different in terms of GDP per head. As you can see on the right hand chart there, you can see that uh, China and India have sped ahead in terms of the level of G the, the growth in their GDP per head, um, whereas some of the other countries, Brazil, South Africa and Russia, have effectively sort of marked time. And the left hand chart echoes that in a way by splitting out emerging market countries into China and India, which is the top line on the chart, and the other emerging market countries. And you can see that over the past five years, the other emerging market countries have tended to grow at a very similar rate to advanced economies. And we tend to think of the advanced economies as having a rather slower growth rate than emerging economies typically. In terms of um, the next big theme, I guess it's probably about unlocking. And the title, Unlocking All, question mark, over the world, question mark, um, I think denotes the uncertainty about all this. Um, the economies hit earliest by the pandemic have started to unlock their economies, I think it's fair to say gradu gradually and tentatively. And there have been some reversals on that as flare-ups of virus uh, COVID-19 attacks have occurred. Our forecast assumes that this gradual trend of unlocking continues and there's no second wave of the virus so that the economic activity gradually increases and you can see this range of charts from the Oxford uh, index you can see sort of Germany as the the, the 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 earlier sort of locking down China also but you can still see China on the on the index certainly as a high degree of lockdown Jagjit in his introductory remarks and slide talked about um, economies, if you like, emerging from a pan pandemic and certainly emerging from the pandemic with higher levels of debt, particularly in the government sector, as this chart shows. And not only are uh, economies having highest public sector debt, but policy interest rates have been reduced back to or below. Um, as a table in the review shows, the emergency low levels seen in the financial crisis. 
And those with memories of emerging from that financial crisis will remember the phrase low for longer, which I think is probably back as a phrase about interest rates. And I've talked about us facing an uncertain future. Um, while we have a, our main case forecast projection based on this process of unlocking and gradual um, increase and the path of COVID gradually reducing, um, as last time, we, we've had a look at what um, the possibility of a second wave might cause. So here we're looking at the possibility of second wave occurring, but not as uh, severe as the first wave. And you can see in terms of the GDP line, the, the damage done by the initial first wave. And then one gets the second wave estimate of a second wave impact coming in. And the recovery there looks more like a, a W, if you like, in GDP than um, something other than that. And clearly, there's a great deal of uncertainty about how likely a second wave is and how severe it would be and also how governments might be able to respond to it were it to occur. So in, in summary, the economic outlook remains uncertain, largely because com countries are still at different stages of the still spreading pandemic and we don't have a cure for the pandemic. Some countries have unlocked gradually but we're still seeing local flare-ups and we're also seeing the the issue that individuals may be so worried that they do not respond to calls to resume previous activities um it's too early to tell i think whether the pandemic the lockdowns so the uncertain the, the whole experience we had over the last three or four months and the uncertainties may have actually changed behavior in a way that fundamentally alters medium-term economic prospects. There is, for example, a lot of talk about working from home, but in that instance, people are still working, but it may have impacts on office space, for example. And looking more broadly, there may be issues about lower cross-border flows of goods, services, people, and capital as uh, individuals and companies and governments react to a new, a new situation. And we've seen substantial fiscal and monetary support. And so medium term inflation risks have also increased on both the upside and we feel the downside. The policy premium, I think, is on global healthcare co coordination to beat the virus and restore confidence in mobility and trade, not just for the ability to go on a holiday this summer, but the ability to be more willing to travel um, in the years to come. Finally, two slides, just firstly to remind uh, the short-term outlook headlines. And then next, just our forecast summary table, which is in the review itself for you all to see. Thank you ever so much for listening. And I'd like now to hand over to my colleague, Gary Young, to talk about the prospects for the UK economy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And I'm going to talk about prospects for the UK economy. This is work that I did with um, Cyril Lionel L and Rory McQueen. So in terms of the headlines for our UK um, forecast, the economic outlook is, of course, extremely uncertain and depends critically on the policies to keep down the COVID-19 infection rate. In our main case scenario, GDP falls by 10% in 2020 and rises by 6% in 2021, which represents a slight downward revision from our previous forecast due largely to the global downgrade of, of their forecasts. In this case, we think there's about an evens chance that GDP will still be below its 2019 peak in the second half of 2023 and public sector net debt is reaching 105 percent of gdp and is likely to remain around that level for a few years at the same time bank rate is expected to remain at very low levels unemployment looks set to rise to around 10 percent by the end of this year 
before dropping back to 6.5% by the end of next year. And we think that an extension of the furlough scheme would have been relatively inexpensive, in the sense that it would have cost quite a bit of money, but compared to the amounts that had already been spent in supporting the economy, it had been relatively expensive, inexpensive and would have limited the rise in unemployment. Now, looking back over the past three months, it's probably fair to say that the worst case scenarios that you might have imagined three months ago have been avoided. The infection rate in the UK has fallen and lockdown measures have been progressively eased so that by now most businesses are allowed to be open, even if they are not able to sell as much as they would like. GDP was lower in May by 25% compared to February. There were some estimates um, three months ago that thought it might be a much bigger effect on GDP, although these estimates are still very uncertain themselves. And total weekly hours in the March to May period were down 17% on a year earlier, and that would be consistent with a fall of about 25% in the second quarter as a whole. So the amount of labour input required is falling in line with the amount of GDP fall. Unemployment rose to, um, the unemployment rate rose to 4.1% in May, which is obviously still very low. But we know that from the, um, some of the faster indicators that there were 760,000 fewer paid employees in June than February. And we know that the claimant count has risen to 2.6 million in June from 1.2 million in February. So it's probably fair to say that the reason the unemployment rate hasn't risen further is that a lot of those people who are un unable to work and not, didn't, don't consider themselves able to search for work in the current circumstances, or at least in the circumstances in May. The coronavirus job retention scheme, which had three months ago had been due to end in June, was extended until the end of October, and the conditions changed, but it will now, it has been confirmed that it will close at the end of October. Another change is that financial markets are no longer stressed, so that's been a positive change over the past three months. But the economy is now entering a new phase where activity is weak due to the avoidance of social consumption largely, just as government support measures are being withdrawn. So it's quite a risky situation we're moving into now. Can we have the next slide, please? There is massive uncertainty about the outlook. And this chart is a sort of UK version of the one Barry showed earlier, showing what we see to be the risks around our main case forecast scenario. So if things go well, you could just about imagine a V-shaped recovery, but the odds are definitely to the downside, largely because of the possibility of a second wave of the virus in the coming winter. So how this chart has been built up is to make an assumption in different countries in the world that there is a second wave, and it has an impact of about of a varying amount of between 48% and 80% of the first wave. So the risks therefore are obviously to the downside. And in terms of the overall risk, there's roughly an evens chance that GDP will still be below its, 20, its level in the second half of 2019 in the second half of 2023. Now this slide summarizes our main case forecast scenario where GDP falls by 10% in 2020 and rises by 6% in 2021. CPI um, inflation falls a bit towards the end of this year and it's already around that sort of level before rising up, up in 2021. Unemployment rises to just below 10% at the end of the year and then falls back to 6.5%. Bank rate remains at rock bottom level in terms of the current account, we don't see the current account getting any worse, even though the, the far right column shows our estimate of the public sector net borrowing rising to about 17% of GDP um, in this year before falling back next year. Now this table is sort of what we would say is a plausible scenario rather than a confident prediction. The risks are very high and the recovery that we do have relies a lot on their remaining stimulatory monetary and fiscal policy. As I just noted, the, um, there is little change in the external deficit, which means really that the higher government borrowing that's expected is largely matched by higher private saving. And I think that's quite important in thinking about the fiscal position, as I'll come on to later. 
In terms of um, the main case scenario, we don't see a return to the pre-COVID path over the next few years, although as the earlier chart showed, that is a possibility, but it's not in our view very likely. So in, this, in our main case scenario, GDP is 6% below its pre-COVID path in 2024. And that largely reflects the fact that we have lower investment throughout this year, next year, and the year after. And because of that, you have weaker capital accumulation. And on top of that, you also have fairly stagnant productivity, which means that potential output doesn't grow very much. Employment falls when the furlough scheme ends, as shown in the right-hand chart, before recovering as the labour market and the economy begin to adjust. But that adjustment, like after the financial crisis, is likely to be associated with weak productivity growth, which is why GDP will remain below its pre-COVID path um, for several years. Now we do assume that the deficit is assumed does return to its pre-COVID path and the outlook for the public finances depends obviously on the pace of the recovery and also what the government chooses to do about the deficit. We've assumed basically that the um, government will try to get the deficit down to the sort of level that was expected pre-COVID but obviously the, the debt stock, the amount of debt will remain elevated because you know the um, borrowing isn't predicted, or we haven't assumed that it will go below the pre-COVID path. And so you end up with a period where net debt settles at around 105% of GDP for a few years in this main case scenario. But even that would require some higher taxes. So in the left hand chart here, I've shown what we're assuming about current spending in real terms. So current spending obviously goes up a lot, this year and it remains high next year before coming back down to slightly below what we might have expected back in January. This is sort of consistent with I think what the Chancellor or some of the things that the Chancellor has said about um, maintaining real growth in, in spending going forward but he's not promising to have anything like the spending that he would was promising in the March budget. Because the economy is smaller we would expect there to be some higher taxes to if, you know, if we're going to achieve the deficit forecast that, that we have. So as you can see in the right hand chart, receipts as a share of GDP are higher um, to achieve that. Now obviously um, you know, we don't know exactly which taxes will be needed to be increased, but we would recommend that there is a sort of reassessment of the tax system and that, you know, that, there's that stock is taken of what taxes are ideal and we have a comprehensive tax review, which is aimed at replacing the piecemeal changes of a principled approach, as for example in the 2011 Merlis review. And in terms of the fiscal deterioration, we think there's no need to panic about that. <clears throat> Interest rates are likely to remain low in the near term, although we can't guarantee that. Interest rates in the UK are largely de determined by what happens to interest rates in the rest of the world and obviously that's outside of the control of domestic policy makers. But as I pointed out earlier, the higher borrowing that we're, ex we're expecting this year and next year is largely being financed by, not directly, but financed indirectly by higher household savings. So as you can see in this chart, um, household savings as a share of GDP or household um, financial balance as a share of GDP rises and that's sufficient to pay for the higher government borrowing without a need for the current account to get worse. So largely the borrowing is being done effectively by borrowing from British citizens rather than from borrowing abroad and that gives you a different perspective on the um, extent of the fiscal deterioration in the sense that the overall balance sheet um, hasn't been damaged by the crisis. The government balance sheet has but the private sector balance sheet is better and so there is room there to raise higher taxes. In terms of the um, unemployment, the um, furlough scheme has prevented a significant rise in unemployment. As we know, around nine and a half million jobs have been furloughed at one time or another, but we don't know exactly how many um, jobs or how many people are on furlough at the moment. This chart is from the ONS surveys, which suggests that um, around 18% of employers in the responding businesses were on furlough leave in the first half of July 
and that's down from a peak of 32 percent um, a month or two ago and that's likely to fall fur further um, as the economy picks up and as the business contribution to the pay of furloughed workers rises so we're expected we would we'd expect to see the number on the furlough scheme decline gradually to the, to the end of October when it when the scheme is ended Now, that is part of the reason why unemployment is set to rise um, quite sharply towards the end of the year. So in our forecast, we were expecting the unemployment rate to rise this quarter. Um, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, there were, there were quite a few people who, or well, there's quite a lot fewer people in work than there were um, back in the beginning of the year. Also, new people joining the labour market all the time. So, you know, there'll be unemployed some of those will be unemployed and so we expect to see the unemployment rate rising to six percent and then to around ten percent at the end of the year when the furlough scheme ends and a number of people flow off the furlough scheme into unemployment they won't all flow off into unemployment some will go back to work but this leads to unemployment being close to ten percent around the end of the year and that will be the highest since 1992-93 Now we think there's a case, there's a relative, there's a good case for keeping the coronavirus job retention scheme open. I mean, the Chancellor, when he launched it, said it was a bridge to the post-COVID world, to the post-crisis world. And I think there's a risk that he's sort of not letting that bridge go as far as is needed. Um, you know, we would have said it would be better to have kept the furlough scheme open until the middle of next year. And then, so we've constructed a scenario to try and work out what that would look like. In the scenario, 1.2 million stay on the scheme at the end of 2020 rather than becoming unemployed. And through next year, there are, another, there are 700,000 who remain on the scheme in this, in this um, scenario. Now, the gross cost of that would be something like up to about £2,000 per job per month. Um, but but you know, that would be, um, you know, in, the, in October, the amount that um, the government is paying support wages is actually less than that, um, and and that the net amount would be would be even smaller because those people on the scheme are paying taxes and they wouldn't be paid benefits. So if you take these sorts of numbers, and that would suggest the overall cost of about ten billion pounds of keeping that number of people on the scheme to the middle of the next year, which as I say is a relatively small amount compared to some of the amounts of money that have been spent in um, supporting the economy this year. And now, if you keep people in work in that way, that would have a benefit in terms of reduced scarring in the sense that those people would eventually return to their jobs. They wouldn't become, they, you know, the possibility of them becoming long term unemployed wouldn't happen. And also, they would keep some of the skills, the firm specific skills that they've learned in the jobs before. And so, we would reckon that that would add a bit to GDP and that would generate tax revenue. And, you know, it would probably come close to paying for itself. Um, over time. In terms of inflation and monetary policy, again, there are lots of risks around inflation, and this fan chart um, sort of tries to show, illustrate what they are. And the risks are to the upside and to the downside. You know, to the downside is a risk that um, you know, there's a big, big um, capacity gap, and that um, this will push down on wages and prices, and this, um, Given that monetary policy is already fully stretched, um, that you could imagine that prices would fall. That would be one scenario. Another scenario on the upside is that there will be, you know, as the economy um, unlocks and as more people go back to work, some of the, that saving that people have been making will be unleashed and people will start spending again. That could, that could give you an upside inflationary pressure. Um, but that would rely on, you know, for that actually to come through into higher inflation, would, would need monetary policy makers to accept um, above target inflation. And they will only really do that when unemployment was high. So it's, anyway, there are at least two risks in either direction. And there's a box on page F21 to 23, which summarizes those risks. So these are the headlines. The outlook is up, is extremely uncertain. I've taken you through one scenario, but the risks are there are risks in both directions. Um, and um, I think given those risks, it would have been better 
to have kept the furlough scheme open so that it did indeed provide a bridge to the other side of the crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Gary, for that overview. Um, so there's a lot in the chapter as well, but um, let's open the floor to questions. And Barry, perhaps you could come online, or back online, as it were, um, for the question session as well. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, Rachel, are we are we taking questions through the chat, or, or can we let people come on and introduce themselves? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you want to ask a question, I'm sure we're all very used to Zoom Q&As by now. Um, <laughs> you can either use the raise your hand function and I'll give you permission to talk and you can unmute yourself. Um, or if you prefer, you can use the chat function and just type us out a question, send it to us and I'll read that out to you. Um, and if you could just say your name and affiliation before asking a question, that would be great. Um, so to start us off, Ed Conway, um, I think from Sky News, sent us a couple of questions during the talk. Yes. So I'll just read those out first. Um, you, so his first question was, um, can you say a bit more about the second wave scenario? What assumptions are you making about the nature of lockdowns, etc.? And is the comparable lack of severity down entirely to the assumption that lockdowns won't be as severe? Thank you, Rachel. I, I know both um, Gary and Barry both had second wave uh, stochastic simulations. I don't know, Gary, would you want to sort of say something briefly about how we arrived at, at that second, both that second wave scenario, but, but how we sort of projected the uncertainty or risk around it? Um, of course, measured uncertainty is risk, but in this world, it's almost all uncertainty, isn't it? Because it, it's not something we've come across before and we're trying to understand this um, with, without that much evidence at the moment. But, but I think Barry as well, if I may, secondly, just to come back to the point on, on the whole deglobalization question and, and why I think people can visualize why trade might get affected, physical stuff, but capital um, is often put alongside it as well. And perhaps you could just take Ed through the, the arguments there. Um, Gary. Yeah, so I mean, obviously it's quite difficult to um, quantify what the risks of a second wave are. And what we did was take some soundings amongst the team, as well as um, you know, looking at what other people are, are saying and came up with a sense that the probability of a second wave in the winter would be in the range of say 20% to 30% or 20% to 33% to be precise. And that if it did occur, it would be less intense than in, in the um, first wave because of the lessons learned and the, um, the assumption that you probably wouldn't have to have a full lockdown, you could lock down um, parts of the economy and, and make it more local. So those assumptions, which is what they are really, um, produce those, those fan charts with sort of risks of quite, you know, quite a significant risk of, of what would normally be very big falls in GDP, but obviously they're not quite as big as the ones that we had, um, we had earlier this year. I suppose it means that our, our central case rises far above the median of the forecast, precisely because that is uh, affected by the significant probability of a second peak, peak or some form of second lockdown or indeed yes, a second spike in the virus. Yeah, the main case is conditioned on the assumption yeah. that there isn't a second wave. Yeah. We are sort of assuming that gradually we go back to normal. Hmm. Um, but, you know, it is, it is a gradual movement back to normal because of the... Um, you know, the social dis the requirement to keep social distance in the fact that social consumption isn't happening on the scale that it was before. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Excellent. Um, Barry, perhaps you could say a few more words about capital flows. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I think w within our scenario, what some of the, the factors that might play a role on capital flows. I mean, the, the, the first one that, that does strike me is the whole issue of um, global value chains and the uh, possible reassessment that's going on. I know there's, um, you know, sort of discussions about uh, are we moving to uh, having stocks in or operating on a, instead of a just-in-time basis, in, to operate on a just-in-case basis and looking at multi-sourcing. Uh, particularly uh, lower sourcing from overseas locations or single overseas locations. And that may play some part in how capital flows may be a bit lower. 
The second issue is obviously, I think, about risk issues. I mean, while um, our forecast, as Gary was saying, is conditioned on a set of assumptions, um, we clearly have no great special insights into the, the epidemiology itself. And certainly one can find people, respected people, who would argue that there are risks of not just a second wave, but of other viruses in the future. And should they come about, some of the risks that we will have already seen would start to play into how people and companies and individuals might think about uh, having capital in other parts of the world and how they might move it around. And thirdly, there's the overall issue of um, deglobalization, which I, I briefly touched on, where we've already seen a sort of a slower growth rate of capital flows more generally over the recent years. And um, box uh, A in our um, scenario, in our review, has some, I, I hope, interesting information on that for you. Thank you, Barry. Yes, but, um, Boxe Bayana and, and, and Amit discusses, I think, the macroeconomics of deglobalization, you know, very concisely, but also very fully, and a sense in which the countries that have contributed to what has been termed the savings glut uh, by recycling their current account surpluses to the advanced economies may adopt a different structure approach over the next decade, and th those savings may not be recycled in the same way and to the extent to which they're kept domestically possibly for the development of domestic savings vehicles and infrastructure, that may in itself reduce the overall amount of flows. And I think the box um, goes through that. And as Barry said, mm -hmm. that's something at the back of all of our minds that this might prompt more of that type of behavior. Um, Gary, um, we, I, I, I noticed a couple of questions coming in on the, on the furlough extension. Um, one from uh, uh, David uh, Goodman at Bloomberg on the, the, the costs of the furlough plan. I know you've done some work on its impact on productivity and employment, which um, you might want to just go through with David. And then there's a, there's a supplementary uh, question from Richard Partington uh, at The Guardian, um, just, just uh, uh, about um, unemployment in more detail. So I wonder if you could pick up those two questions, Gary. Yes, um, Thank you. I'll, try and t I'll try and take them t together. So yes. um, yeah, there's, there's been a lot of information published about the furlough scheme, but a lot of it has been about how many people have used the scheme in, in its, you know, it, since it's been around, rather than how many people are on the scheme at the moment. So I think there's probably somewhere in the region of five to six million on the scheme at the moment, but that would be diminishing over the rest of the year as the um, economy picks up, and because of uh, the fact that employers now having to make a, or progressively having to make a bigger contribution to the scheme. Um, they will um, possibly lay, pe lay people off or just, or just take them back into work. So our assumption is that, um, you know, there might be, say, you know, there, there would be around, um, around uh, just over a million, a million and a quarter people in the fourth quarter um, would have been on the furlough scheme had the furlough scheme remained open. But because of the closure of the scheme, they become unemployed. And so that contributes to the, um, to the unemployment forecast we have of just under 10% at the end of the year. So roughly, um, you know, the labour force is just over, what's what it, about 33 million. So, you know, a million is roughly about three percentage points of, of that. Um, so, you know, on that basis, the cost of the scheme wouldn't be, and that, and that, that number would then be diminishing throughout next year as well. So the cost of the scheme wouldn't be too high. So if you say, well, for one job, it would cost you at most about £2,000 a month, um, but then those people would be paying taxes and they wouldn't be paying benefits. So the net cost would be smaller than that. And if you add it all up, keep the scheme open for another eight months, it would cost you in the region of £10 billion on, on the basis of, of that case. Um, so I don't know if that's answered all of that. Yeah, so unemployment, if the furlough scheme is extended, we have a, we had a chart. There's a chart in the review on um, figure two, actually. I don't, and it was in the presentation as well, of a comparison of the unemployment rate with and without the scheme. Um, 
next one. Yeah, so that one. So that that's um, so as I say, we, we would have about um, six percent un unemployment at the end of this year without the scheme, and then that declines over the next year. So you can see the difference between the two cases in that chart there. Thank you, Gary. Very clear. Um, Rachel, do we have any further questions or any any raised hands that I can't see? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have any raised hands at the moment, but uh, feel free anyone to chime in with the question if you'd like. We have a second question from Ed Conway, oh. which I'll just read out that um, he is asked um, specifically following on from Barry's presentation. Um, Barry, you mentioned the risk of lower cross border flows in future. Mm -hmm. Is that reflected in the forecast at all? And why might capital flows also end up being constrained? Thank you, Rachel. I think we've answered the second part of that. I'm kind of wondering to the extent to which we're conditioning on, on deglobalization in our, in our long run. I, I suppose we're not. It's more, more of a risk. Is, is that right, Barry? Just as always, uh, of that. Sorry, sorry, Joe. I think so, yeah, yes. Not at all. Not at all. Um, it, the, the forecast is, is more on, if you like, current trends rather mm. than a, a change to a, a new mm. environment in, mm. in that context. Yes. Thank you. Um, Lovely. So we just got a, a third question from Ed, um, <laughs> which we can, I think we can squeeze in there. Um, just following up on what you said, Gary, about the furlough scheme, um, you said it would almost pay for itself. Could you elaborate on that? Um, or did Ed mishear that? No, that, no, that was what I said. Um, and the reason for that is because, you, you know, obviously the people who are on furlough, they're not really doing anything different to being unemployed, but they, they do have the um, prospect of going back to work. So, that, so there's a number of things going on, really. One is that they would be more confident, and people generally be more confident had the furlough scheme um, stayed open. So that would probably mean that spending would be a bit higher. And for that reason, there might be more demand in the economy and a bit more activity. But in the longer run, you know, one of the things we learned through previous recessions is that when people become unemployed, they um, tend to lose their attachment to the labour market. And that means that, and they become, by becoming long-term unemployed, they lose their attachment to the labour market. And that tends to mean that the equilibrium amount of unemployment in the economy goes up. So what we've done in this analysis is to assume that there's been, there is some, but by keeping the, the furlough scheme open, there would be um, lower long-term unemployment because of it. And also there would be, wouldn't be so much lost, lost productivity because people, who were trained in particular jobs would, you know, in, the, in those jobs and in those for that specific um, places would um, continue to have those skills. So we've made an assumption about there being extra productivity and less lower long-term unemployment. And that would add a bit to GDP in the longer term, not a massive amount, but um, it would be a permanent, GDP would be permanently higher because of the, by, by not having these scarring effects. And that then would generate higher tax revenue. And so in the long run, the um, extra tax revenue would be more or less enough to pay for the, the extra 10 billion of keeping the scheme open to the middle of next year. So that's what I meant. Um, it's obviously another uncertainty, but um, you can see the direction which it's going in. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Well, I think we're coming towards uh, the end of the hour. I don't know if there's time for one final remark from either uh, Barry or Gary before we, we, we wrap up. Barry, is there anything that you just want to bring out as a final message? I know you, we talked quite a lot about the need for coordinated um, international policy. Did you, did you have in mind debt relief or, or something at the level of the G20 or, um, or more? Or, or is it, is it, 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 it in the sense in which the in interventions we've seen have happened at the same time because the virus uh, appeared at the same kind of time around the world, but but what what more might we want to see from international policymakers? Um, do you feel as as we head into a, a recovery, but then at the back of our mind the concern that there may be further spikes and uh, uh, and economic repercussions from those as time goes on? Yes, I, I think one one observation I'd make mm. is that um, we have already seen the IMF. Um, actually provide some relief funding and set up schemes to do so. Mm -hmm. And over a hundred countries have applied to the IMF now to um, 
access funding. We've also seen the G20 agree um, to some moratorium on debt uh, interest payments and we've seen the World Bank also come forward with um, proposals for debt relief. Mm. One of the things that I, I think will be important and I'm, I'm not sure whether it, it's it actually comes under the heading of coordination mm. but it is the sense that um, the, the, the there's almost two things going on one is an immediate short-term crisis that mm. needs to be addressed and and uh, different countries are being helped at different times or will need help at different times but I think for, for some countries certainly there'll be a question of what are the scarring effects of the crisis and what will the international agencies and the major advanced economies governments um, be able to do to help and the obvious place for me to start on that is on healthcare mm. and particularly um, should a, a vaccine become available the ability to make that available at a uh, very cheap cost or free or whatever the term is to you know, countries throughout the globe not just one or two countries and I think that does that those sort of things will require a degree of coordination and agreement at the very highest level. Thank you very much. I wonder if, uh, Luca, we can just get the chart showing world GDP um, um, both prior to um, this, this sort of with the trend um, as we anticipated from the time of the global financial crisis, the trend before COVID came along and what we now think is going to be, yes, the left-hand side one. And I, and I suppose, Barry, that is precisely the scarring issue that we have in mind. The, the, the world as a whole is going to have less output than we considered, which is making that debt problem for countries that, that don't have the fiscal space or the tax revenues uh, or the ability to raise taxes in the way that Gary was talking about, problematic. Uh, and that's why these payment difficulties will be have, to, have to be ones that we would hope that international financial institutions can turn to work out over time because they will impede the growth, particularly of poorer countries, which we think is a concern. Is, is that fair? Uh, absolutely. I mean, and, and yes. just, just to add to that, I mean, obviously our, our anticipation or our projection is that interest rates stay low, which is a, a positive for servicing debt. Mm. But I think as we've, as we've found in the pandemic, um, there's a lot of focus on the interest burden of debt. Mm. But of course, if you don't have the income <laughs> in, the, in the first place, there's even more of a burden of debt. And debt has increased, um, as we've looked at in several, particularly in the May review, mm. uh, we, we had a piece on uh, global debt position there. And debt in, certainly in companies in emerging countries has increased quite rapidly, as more rapidly than government debt. Um, but the current situation is increasing that debt. Mm. And we've seen sharp depreciations in currencies, which will also add to problems about debt servicing so i think this is not just a a very short term issue it's a more long term issue yes. that, that needs to be addressed and particularly okay. if we do not see the growth in um emerging economies that we probably were used to seeing in the first half of the last decade yes yes they're, they're going to be constrained i think you're a number of um, articles that you've written the last year hi highlighted this very clearly, and uh, I think we need to reread them and remember uh, the extent to which these will act as a constraint for many of the nations in the world that are already at the bottom of the income level, uh, income distribution. Gary, is there any final word you want to say before we wrap up this morning? Um, well, I think this is going to be an interesting few years ahead <laughs> you know, once we get past uh, COVID, um, which is um, obviously the short term. Mm. Concern, but beyond that, um, we thought it was going to be challenging before with Brexit. Um, yeah. But there'll obviously be a fiscal um, fiscal issue. I mean, I don't think people have got any appetite for public services to be cut again. So I think we have to think about which taxes to put up. Okay. Thank you. Taxes. That's a good place to end. I think. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank you, Rachel, for organising this for us, Gary and Barry and the team for yet another excellent uh, piece of analysis. We are available to answer questions whenever.
but particularly today as you write up your pieces, please do get in touch um, with our uh, comms team led by Luca, uh, Rachel, Phil and Chloe. We'll be happy to guide you in the right direction. Um, we very much enjoy putting these things into the public domain and we're here at your disposal to help you do that for us as well. So thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we hope to see uh, you soon and hopefully uh, one day uh, back at Dean Trenchstead, uh, our home. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.